Hi, good morning. Um, so on Friday, the TA will cover for the first 20 minutes. He'll go over the, pro the projects um, and, you know, fuse again. And I should be back by 11. If I'm not here, he'll, I'll, I'll give you something to cover for the rest of the class. So we will have class on Friday, just not me for the first few minutes. Right? Make sense? <coughs> so do we have any, do you have any questions about what we covered so far? So one of, the, one of the things that we are, um, as we move along with the, the notion of files and stuff, right, you'll begin to notice that they begin to look sort of like the memory system um, with little, there's some similarities, there's some differences, and, um, and as you move along, you tend, you tend to notice that they kind of begin to merge a little bit, and some of the concepts are what we'll see in today's lecture, right? Starting with this notion of a, uh, temporary file system, RAM file system, which is what sort of I uh, left off at the last lecture. The idea here is one of the things that people noticed is there are a lot of temporary files which are created, which look like files because they, they are, you know, you create them in a file system, you, you, you give them a name, but you don't really expect them to stay around for long, meaning they get created, somebody writes into them, and somebody opens them, reads them, and then deletes them, right? For example, one of the things that happens is if you try to, say, compile a program, C program, right? If you do the GCC minus V, you will notice that it goes through multiple different steps, right? For example, it may do a compilation, two steps of compilation, and each of the steps may create different um, files. So essentially, you, you take a .c file, you may create a .i file, which some other program reads it, right? So this program will open, write this file, close this file. This program will open, read this file, close this file, and then delete this file, right? So it's gonna create another output, and which is gonna get another output, and so on and so forth. So there's a last output, which is probably your executable file. So what you really want is the, the .c file to stay, and dot .out file to stay. All the intermediate files, if the system were to crash, and if these files tend to, you know, the files were lost, you probably won't notice it because you didn't create them. They were created by something within the compilation process. Right? So for these, these things, what they're really trying to do is create a shared memory. Right? They're creating a shared memory such that this process can send something to here. They're using the file system to send something, but they're not really creating a file. Right? They're not creating a file which has to exist forever and all those things. So one way to speed up the system would be to treat them as memory, right? treat them like a shared memory. <coughs> And the way to do that is to take your virtual memory and build a file system on top of it, right? You take a big chunk of memory and build a file system on top of it. And you can very easily do that for with your fuse, right? So it look like a file system, it lack like a file system. Everything you write into it will lack like a file system. Except when the when the when you reboot the system, everything is gone, right? And if it's gone, so if you reboot, if you boot back again, your dot C file will stay your dot out file will say any of this stuff could be gone, right? And that improves the system performance a lot. And that's one of the op optimizations that you tend to do. And the thing you notice is if you make this into a virtual memory, remember the virtual memory system uh, from last, last module, right? So if you're running out of pages, you will begin to swap them into swap disk, right? So now we have this funny notion that you want to avoid writes, so you create this chunk of memory into a file system, but the file system itself may be swapped out to a swap disk, so it may actually go into a disk and come back, right? So it's sort of like a file system, sort of like a virtual memory. It's sort of this kind of a weird notion, right? Does that make sense? You, you, you allocate some chunk of memory for your, files, for your file system, which you don't really want to go to disk. But since it's a virtual memory, all the things we, we learned from last class comes in, right? If you run out of virtual memory, then you will have to replace some pages. So you will choose one of these pages just like anything else. And those may go to swap disk, those may come back from swap disk. As long as things are kind of okay, you don't notice much of this problem, so you're kind of okay, right? But that may happen. So actually, even though you didn't want them to go to disk, it may go to swap disk and the same kind of penalties and stuff. So you're kind of blurring the notion of what is files and what is memory. You're treating them like a memory through this file system. And, but it does get to disk because of the swap, swap notion, right? Does that sort of make sense? <coughs> right. So you begin to notice this kind of uh, behavior, right? 
And this is the notion of temp file system. To give you a sense of how these things uh, work, I logged into one of the, the CS, um, the machine, Wizard, which is a Solaris machine. It's true for all Linuxes and uh, Mac and all those things. So there are a couple of commands that you can use to figure out what is the file systems in a, in a currently executing system, right? One is a command called df, which shows all the, the display file systems. And I think it's kind of going off the screen. But essentially, it tells you that this is the file system, right? The first entry is a file system. And this is the size and the how much size is left and, and where it's mounted, right? Let me try to make this a little smaller. Can you see the size from the from the last row? Yeah. <coughs> so, the, so if you look at the output, the first is the file system, and the next one is the uh, size of the file system, how much is uh, used, and how much is available, and what how much of the capacity is used, and where it's mounted on, right? So, this particular file system, let's say, this particular file system is mounted on here. That means if you go to slash user slash vice slash cache, you're really accessing that file system, right? And you can look through the stuff to see some of the stuff you may rec recognize, right? Um, and another, so like for example, slash temp and slash var temp is really in, in swap, right? So that means they are really uh, a temporary file system. So if you write into slash temp on this machine, you're really writing it to swap, which is really the virtual memory based uh, memory file system. So anything you write here, if you make the machine reboots, is gone, right? Which also means that these, these things will be very fast. So one of the other commands that you can use to uh, copy files in and out or create files uh, on a quick notion, uh, quick, quickly is this, is this program. Let me write the command. So this is this, this command called dd, which is like a disk dump, which is essentially uh, like a low level, uh, it, it creates like a backup kind of thing. So this particular program takes input file, it reads from this file, it writes into this file, and the block size that I want to write, it, it writes in blocks. Block. So I'm just gonna give 4096, a 4K block, just, just, for the, just for trying it out, and count. So I want to create 4,000 blocks I want to copy 4K blocks, 10,000 of those, right? And I'm going to read from this file called dev0, right? If this is a kind of magical file in Unix. If you read this file dev0, it'll keep giving you zeros, right? So if you read 1,000 times, you get 1,000 zeros and so on and so forth. So this is a quick way to create a, any size file that you want. All the entries in this file will be zero. So essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a file called slash temp slash file right, House, uh, with, with 4,096 blocks of 10,000. So it's essentially 4,096 times 10,000. That bigger file I'm gonna create on, on the temporary uh, swap file system. I'm gonna time, time it to see how fast it takes, right? This is a way to see how, uh, how quickly we can do this stuff. Oops. So I, I created 10,000 records in about, um, 0.33 second. You can see up there, right? So the user time is 0 0.03 second, and the system time is 0 0.29, so the overall time is 0 0.33 second, right? To give you a sense of how, how bad it would be if I do this in my... Um, if I do this in my AFS space, which is a distributed file system, right? I do the same thing. I'm trying to create a 4,096 times 10,000 block, and it's still creating. So it, it took about 15 seconds, right? So if I actually were to use this on the real disk, I mean, again, there are caches and stuff, but even then you can notice that if I use the memory file system, it's so much faster, right? You, you go from practically 
one third of a second to about 15, 15 or so seconds, right? So having the temporary file system is a really, uh, really good thing because all these temporary files get created really fast. You completely ignore the notion of persistence, but that's okay. Your compilation and all will go much faster because of, of this stuff, right? So you can use these commands to kind of test your file system to see how fast things are. Uh, on a rough estimate because of, of course with, with caching and stuff, if I want to do something over and over again, then things get cached and all those things, but at least the first run should not be cached, you should be able to get a good sense. Make sense? That gives you a sense of how, um, <clears throat> why, why you would want to do a memory file system, because those things are way much faster than what you can get from a disk-based file system, right? So before, so the, the next notion is something that we didn't cover from before on chapter nine. We'll look at that here, right? That's the notion of a memory map file, right? So, so far we have looked at two concepts, right? There's a notion of, a, so you, if you, in your program, you have a chunk of memory, right? Going back to memory module, you have a chunk of memory, right? And you write into it and you read from it and so on and so forth. Virtual memory basically means that if this gets full, it writes into a swap disk, right? It creates a swap disk. It has notion of blocks, same like what you see in the file system, because it's the same disk you may write into. So you have these blocks. So what happens is virtual memory basically keeps anything you write here, it stays here till it has to be replaced. In that, at that instant, it has to be returned here, and then it, it, it may be brought here, right? So the virtual memory system basically moves pages back and forth between here to make sure that it manages the, the memory for you, right? So that's what virtual memory system does, right? And if you think of them as files, right? You want to create this notion of a file, which means that it has to go into the same kind of disk, the same kind of blocks, and so on, right? When you use the file, you have the notion of open, close, read, and write, and everything, right? If I exactly follow the right model that you call from your program, the performance of this thing will be really awful, right? So for example, if you have a loop which says while one, write one byte, right? You go through a loop and you're writing one byte, right? This would really mean, if, you, if I have to do it exactly what you, what you meant, I would have to read the block because I can't write into the half into the block, right? So I have to read the block, write the block, right? So every iteration, I would have to read the previous block, modify this one value, write it back. Read, write, read, write kind of thing, right? Your performance will be really, really awful. So no operating system you know would, would want to do that. What it'll do is, you'll try to have a buffer here and every write you send to it, you'll keep collecting it, and at some point, you'll write it back to the disk, right? So if you look at this model, right, so you, logically you want to do this, but essentially what happens is everything gets collected here, at some point, it's gonna to decide to write it back, right? They look awfully similar, right? The same notion that you keep writing it to this buffer, and at some point, somebody decides to write it, right? The only difference here is, when this program exits, you don't have to flush the contents from here to the disk, right? Because if it's a virtual memory, if your program exits, you don't care about the memory, so you can flush it. So if you remember from your last homework project, you don't have to count the last dirty pages because your program is exiting, who cares? Whereas in a file, when you exit your program, when you close the thing, everything here from this buffer has to be flushed, right? Other than that, your virtual memory is already doing all this stuff. It is maintaining all this notion of a small amount of memory, right? We, we, we may call this logical address space, and here we may call it buffer, but the concept is the same. I'm writing something into here, and the operating system decides when to write it, right? The only difference, again, is you, you know this is a file, so you want to make sure that this write is happening more often than it's here, but otherwise it looks sort of the same, right? So the idea next is to kind of merge these two, right? Why, why build the notion of a file? Why build the notion of a virtual memory? System is gonna have virtual memory anyway, so why don't we kind of map the notion of files into virtual memory, right? And that's the notion of memory map file, and that's used a lot. So the idea here is you make 
think that you're opening a file, but what I really do is I kind of take this file. So if, if your file happens to be here, right? I open, I map this area into a segment, just like you would do there, right? And map it here. And then I give you the pointer to the start of this stuff. You can treat this as a memory, just like you would, you would do on the virtual memory system. But I promise that everything you write here would be written back at some point, right? So you will kind of blur the notion. So, right, so that's the notion of a uh, memory map file, right? And we'll see an example of how this is done. So the, yeah, so the, the idea is, you know, since, since both of them look awfully similar, there's very slight differences. You could reuse the same concept within the file system, within the, the operating system. You don't have to repeat the code. And you may actually get better performance because the, if you really tune the virtual memory to be very good, right, it may decide to write these things at much better scale than what you can do in your program. Like I said, if, you, if your program was to do exactly what you wanted, it has to read this, read this buffer and write the buffer all the time. Rather than make one set of decisions for files, one set of decisions for memory, you may try to do merge both into this notion of memory mapped files, right? And so the idea here is once you did this, you know your file becomes part of the virtual memory and you can do the sharing just like you would do for virtual memory and so on and so forth, right? Once you do that, actually you could, you could create, the nice thing with, with this model is many of you when you write files, right? You read, you read stuff from the file, you create internal data structures like with pointers and stuff like that within your program. And then when you want to write it back, you serialize it. You, you kind of read the, read the whole thing and write it back, right? So if you, for example, if you want to create a, a tree structure, you would read all the records from the file, build this internal memory structure called the tree. But when you want to write it back to the disk, you would walk the tree and then write it, write only the leaf nodes, right? Does that, does that make sense, right? You don't actually write a, a whole tree data structure into the into the disk because you want to uh, get the stuff. But whereas when you do this memory mapping, you could leave the complicated structure as it is, right? As I'll, I'll, I'll show that with an example. So here's an example using a memory map of a file system, um, for a file. So again, here we're taking the notion of a file. This is a POSIX code, right? Um, so what I do is, this is a simple program which you, you, you realize from the from earlier times, right? I open a file called path, which happens to be file, right? I open it for write-only, create, and trunk, which means that if the file exists, I delete it. I basically create a zero-byte file. And then I write, hello world, right? Hello space world. I could have put it into one thing, but you know, for some reason I did twice. And then I close it, right? So this way, you expect at the end of this run, your file called file, We'll call. We'll have. We'll have hello space world, right? So that's written into this file, right? This is this is the traditional way you you think of how you do this with the files files, right? So to do with mmap, right? Ignore all the all the bits. You know, you can look at the manual pages to see what what those are. Essentially, what I'm trying to do is I want to map this particular file into my address space, right? And the the mapping happens such that pointer will now point to the, the file from where I mapped, right? So I'm going to map this particular file um, with, 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 these, with these flags, right? I, I, I have to first open the file. So ignore the arguments, you know, you can look at the map page to see where the arguments are. But essentially I map this file into my memory, which means that now the, this variable called ptr would point to this file as a memory. Right? So I can do all the things I would do with memory. I can do a PTR plus plus two, which is basically I'm sort of seeking to two bytes, right? Um, and actually, I, I said I started from, so I, I, I copied this stuff, right? I copied LP. So, so I basically copied LP starting from address. Uh, okay, so I copied, Three, three bytes here. What do you, can you see what this will do? The map. what I did was I mapped the first four bytes starting at zero bytes. And I did pointer plus, so when I did the mapping, pointer was pointing here. Then I did pointer plus two, so it goes here, 
right? Right, right? And then I, I copied over LP space, right? What would happen to this this thing? It'll become help space help space space world, right? And then I do a hem unmap. That's part of the uh, un unmapping, which is sort of like the close. Then you close the stuff, right? So this piece of code would modify hello world to help space space world by treating this contents of the file in as a memory program, right? Do, do you see how it's how it's done? So people who use memory memory map will find it very very useful. They can do very, like really weird stuff within uh, with M, uh, M map and stuff, right? A lot of your libraries use M map and stuff because essentially you're treating them like a virtual memory. So all the things you did for virtual memory holds. So even if you unmap it, it may still be left in the virtual memory because that's part of the memory, memory system optimization. So for example, you can write a code like this. Suppose you want to have a data structure, um, a struct which has two entries, which has a value and a pointer, right? And I want to have this value is two, and then this pointing to another structure. This is a like a very simple data, linked list structure that you you could you would you may want to do, right? Essentially, it, it has uh, two linked list structures. This pointer points to this entry, right? And you have this linked list structure. In a traditional file, you would you would probably write it as you would write two um, in some sort of a separator, and then say three, right? Then you have to build this linked list again, <coughs> right? Whereas if you do an M map, then essentially you you had PTR, right? So I can treat this this as a memory, this as a memory. As long as it is relative to this pointer, I can write it as it is. I can write the, with the pointers, right? So I may be able to write into the disk two, and let's say this was zero, and, and this I happen to assign it as 100. I can write two, 100, three, zero. And when I read it again, I could reconstruct these pointers because they're still part of my map entries. Does that make sense? So you can actually write this whole data structure into file and then bring it back. As long as it's relative to where you started from within your mapping, you can do something like this, right? So this may be a very pro pro powerful way for you to do this stuff. And if you if you do any kind of serious program, you notice a lot of times you're just writing back and forth into the disk. You're trying to change this abstraction of memory with pointers and all those things. But when you try to write to disk, you're trying to do this write, read, and seek, and all those things, which are another kind of abstraction. With this model, once you figure out how to do this M map and M map, that's all you have to do. And after that, you can treat this like memory. The only thing you have to remember is this is mapped to a file, so anything you modify will eventually go back to disk. So anything you modify here will modify the disk, and so on and so forth. And most programs, most most real programs will use M map, right? Uh, so yeah, that, that that's the. Is that clear how to use M map? Again, this is part of the trend that you know. Suddenly, you notice that these these two are sort of similar, sort of different. Um, the files files base. The, the only difference in files is you have the same concept of memory, but you want them to survive through. Um, uh, you want it to be persistent. You don't have to be persistent. So now we kind of have to merge merge both these things to get better performance. And then then you have the notion of caching, right? We, I, I've kind of mentioned that writing into the disk is very slow. So you want to do some sort of a caching, right? So you end up having two kinds of cache, right? One is a page cache, and one of the uh, is called a buffer cache. I may call it differently, but essentially what it does is page cache is a cache is a cache for your paging system, your your memory system, right? And buffer cache is a cache for your file system, 
But essentially, they're doing the same thing. I'll just give it a different name. But essentially, what I'm doing is page cache is a cache between your memory and the swap disk. Buffer cache is a cache between your program buffer, your, your program writes, and the disk, right? So we have these two different concepts. If I built them separately, if I didn't, didn't think about them as, as two different concepts, I would have a page cache into your operating system. I would have a buffer cache into your operating system. They start up doing the same thing for the most part, but not quite. I mean, they, they have a little bit difference, right? Page cache, you have to remember when it's not needed, you can just throw it, right? If you, if you, if you exit the program, you can throw the page cache. Whereas if it's a file cache, it has to be pushed back to the disk. You have to be a little bit more aggressive on the buffer cache because, I mean, again, when the machine, if the machine was to crash halfway through, you don't want the stuff to be in buffer, right? So if you have a buffer cache and you keep writing into a file and you keep writing into the file forever and ever and ever, you don't want to kind of wait till the end because eventually you have to, you have to be a little, bit, a little bit more aggressive on writing to disk. But other than that, you have the same thing, right? So I may call them as page cache and buffer cache, but they start up the same, right? So earlier operating systems, didn't think about them as two different concepts. So they had the notion of page cache and buffer cache and file system. This is how they sort of built it, where page cache, since it's a memory cache, it builds off of the, the file system cache because it's, you know, it's writing to a soft disk, which is a file system. So you end up having this different hierarchy, right? Which essentially would not be much of a problem for you as long as you only went one one way, right? If you do a memory map file, you went that way. If you went this way, you went this way. Life was good, right? But once you have this memory map files and you try to do both, you try to treat the same file as a file or as a um, memory map file, you may end up going through these two uh, ways, right? Which means that you may access the same file as a file and as a memory map file on the same program or different programs. The one which treats it as a memory map file would go through this model, which means that it, it will first have a notion of a page cache, and when the page is replaced, it gets pushed to the buffer cache. If you're treating it as a file, you don't have explicit buffer, so it, it goes to the buffer cache, right? Does that make sense? So what will happen is sometimes this IO may read something which was already modified here, but it's on the page cache. Right? So if you wrote the same, if you wrote two programs, one of it treating it as a file, one of it treating it as a, a memory map file, since you have these two buffers, it may happen that this read will get some contents which has already been written or modified by, by that program, but it's being in that cache, right? So you end up with this problem of you cannot mix both because if you, if you mix both, then some entries may, may be inconsistent, right? So that, that's the problem you run into. So the, the, the solution is to unify both, meaning like get rid of both the, both the caches and essentially come up with this, right? Which is memory map IO and, and the whole system now has only one cache, right? So the whole system, module three and four, essentially will have only one cache. That cache will be treated as page cache or buffer cache, depending on how you, how you go about it, right? And it kind of started off with being memory map uh, IO kind of stuff, but in, in the general scheme, this is a good thing, right? So essentially now we have only one page scheme replacement policy that you, you had from the last module, right? You may, as a programmer, treat it as a file. You may call seeks and, and what have you. You may call it as memory map or whatever, whichever is easy for you. But essentially all of them are trying to do the same thing. So now I kind of merged the virtual memory and the file system into the same thing, right? I may, as operating system, kind of keep track of notion that these are part of buffers and these are part of the page. So I may flush them to disk at different rates at different uh, whatever. But the entire system is now one thing, right? There's this notion that you have something that you operate on, there is a, a, a cache, and that flushes back to the disk, right? So the backing store may be a swap, swap disk for memory system. It may be a file for your program, right? but the concept becomes unified in this unified buffer cache. Did that make sense how these two modules are really the same, even though they are different? Right? 
you may have little policy tweaks. I mean, you want if you want to optimize for stuff, you may want to avoid some things. So, for example, if you have page cache, you may not want to write it that often because you know you're a page cache kind of thing. But there is really not much of a difference, right? Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to capture as much of stuff as possible closer to the application, right? Remember the hierarchy, right? I want to keep it as much closer to you, as much in the cache rather than the disk. And you want the flexibility for the operating system to flush it into the disk when it wants to. You don't want it to do it every time that you write because then your performance will be really, really, really awful. So you want these things to do something smart, right? Rather than tuning, creating two smart systems into the same operating system, you want to have one smart system and kind of tweak it a little bit uh, for whatever you want to do. But essentially have one, one scheme which you may access it in two different schemes, the stuff, right? Can you think of a reason why you would want to keep one way of doing stuff rather than two ways of doing stuff within an operating system? Yes? Maintenance of redundant pieces of code? Yeah, same reason that you will have for your homework projects and stuff like that, right? The more code you have, the more logic you have, the more possibilities for bugs, right? Operating systems are no different. I mean, operating systems may have lots of people operating on the stuff. They're trying to make sure there's no bugs, but you still run into bugs and everything, right? The, the, the lesser amount of code you have, the lesser complexity you have, hopefully you will, you will be able to debug them. You'll be able to have um, some sort of a sanity because you have only one way of doing things, right? You want to avoid having two different things sort of doing the same thing, but a little bit different. So if you try to modify one, then the other things will break kind of stuff. So you want to keep them into as one, one, one policy, one, one kind of system. So it, it reduces the operating system complexity a lot, right? Because otherwise, remember in the last case, you have this page cache and the buffer cache and the other way going through right to the buffer, to the buffer cache. That means you'll have to make sure that there's some code which says if the file is already open in MMAP, then look into the page cache first, then before going to the buffer cache. Then you add all these complexities. You're maintaining a page cache separately. You're maintaining a buffer cache separately. And you're also now trying to make sure that if something gets accessed halfway through, then you want to make sure that you, you look in the page cache. If not, look in the buffer cache. Things get uh, messy. But with this one, you kind of um, make, make everything simpler, right? So most of your programs, most of your PowerPoint and all those serious programs use memory map files. They don't actually op do this open read and write and everything, right? Those are simple enough for you to use, but once you begin <coughs> to write more serious programs, memory map files are, are really, really nice, right? And I didn't actually go through the notion of what those bits are, right? So uh, if you remember the There's this notion of protect, uh, read, write, and, and share, and stuff like that, right? We'll see a little bit of that in the, in the last module, notion of protection. But actually, you can, you can actually do a lot of nice stuff, right? So here, you're saying, I want these things to be mapped, but I want this protection to be read and write, right? This is the concept you, you had from the um, memory module, right? Memory module, you had the notion of, segments which are read only, write only, or execute only, and all those things, you can give those things to this program, right? So what, you, what this could do is, essentially you're saying, I want to map, actually the, the code here is, I want to map starting at zero for four, four bytes, right? I want to map that segment as read write into this pointer, right? So what would happen if you tried to modify this bit? You use that code. I'm saying says map. So actually, there's a bug because you know I, I tried to modify till here, right? Let's say I, I, I mapped till here to here, right, into my program, and then I in my program I tried to modify this D, right? What do you think would happen? What do you think should happen? Or what do you think may happen? This goes back to the memory concepts, right? You, you may get a segmentation fault, right? Because if you do the right way, you're trying to say, 
I only want to map these five bytes, right? I'm saying there's, there's a bug here because I, I modified till here. So this should have been uh, five, right? Um, uh, right? So you're saying I only want to modify certain bits here, right? This mmap did not map this into your program in read or write or whatever, right? So if you try to read this, your operating system may give you a fault, right? Depending on how it's implemented, you know, it may be within a block and all those things, but in general, you may get a fault if you try to read this. You may get a fault if you try to write this, right? So your program can actually be more complicated. You can actually use this read and write notion to compartmentalize and say, you as a function are only allowed to modify this part of the file. You can't really touch any of this stuff because if you do, you get a segmentation fault, which is a concept you got from, from the memory system, right? Otherwise, as a file, if I give a file descriptor, you're free to modify any of those stuff, right? So I give you more power that you get from the memory system. So when you write these programs, you can actually selectively only map little pieces and chunks right there. So you're getting, sort of getting for free this notion of even if your program was to have a bug, it cannot possibly write more than what you map because anything else would, would give you a fault. And that's a concept which comes from memory. So as a programmer, this is a really good thing because now it's file descriptor, I can modify anything with, with the memory notion. If you try to modify something other than what was mapped to you, you get errors. And you can play with those bits. So you can actually write really powerful programs by playing with those, with those bits, right? How to use them is beyond the scope of what we're going to do in this class. But if you have time and if it's something that you would like to look at in terms of files, look at the mmap. mmap can do really, really nice stuff at the user, user level. And, and you'll see most of the programs tend to use uh, mmap. So, the, so, so essentially, at this point, they, yeah, they're, they're both the same, even though there's like little differences, but they're kind of under, underlying, uh, in, under, uh, under the hood, they are the same, right? The, the, the two modules, except one has to go on the disk and stay in the disk. From your perspective, they're different, but from the OS perspective, they may or may not be the same, right? So this is one of the reasons why, when you buy more memory, your system, it's kind of hard to tell how much free memory you have. If you look at, you can look through different stuff, but it's never clear to you exactly how much memory you have because, because of all this stuff. There are different kinds of caches, some use for memory, some use for file systems. They're all taking memory from the same general pool. The more memory you have, the better performance you get. But it's kind of hard to pin down which is actually being used by you, which is actually sort of there, right? Everything that you operate is part of, is mapped into your virtual memory, and the swap, it moves back and forth between the swap. And the, the question of, how much free memory you have in a system is kind of ridiculous. So when you see those applications which say, if you run this with your PowerPoint, it'll clean up your memory and, and it'll give you a lot more free memory, it's meaningless because you want to do all this kind of stuff. You want to keep moving stuff, you want to have as much cash, cash as possible. You don't want to be nailed down and say, this is free memory, not being used by anybody. That's a base. You don't want things to be free, you want it to be used by some buffer, right? So there are other things when you, you have with the files when we kind of looked at them as we moved along. One is the notion of if you ever mess up something on the disk, right? If you uh, get, get messed up with your directory entries or, or what have you, you have to have some program to clean it up, right? Because the, the file systems, if you forget, if you mess something up, you have to do some operations to clean this up because otherwise you'll have blocks which are allocated but not being used anywhere, right? Or files which are pointing to the same entry and all those things. And the, the, the programs is either scan disk or FSCK in Unix and so on and so forth. And essentially, they're trying to go through the file system to make sure that if all their links are fine. And depending on how complex you want it, it may take a while because it has to go through all the files and figure out what, which, is, which is free and stuff, right? So they, they're done in two different modes. In one, in one mode, they try to make sure that you're, you're good to go. In another mode, they go and clean up all the stuff. They may pick up entries which were not allocated to anybody, but nobody knows about it kind of thing. So if your free block entry is wrong, you go through a more uh, elaborate process to figure out all the files accessible, right? And another way where you just make things go, you know, the wasted blocks are left, left wasted, but you, but you make progress, right? And one of the ways to solve this problem People notice that regardless of how you do, regardless of how you try to do the stuff, things always get messed up because there's so many caches along the way, right? 
this one cache we, we're not talking about here, which is underlying all the stuff, which is the disk cache, right? When you buy any of these disks, right, the disks are not, uh, the storage that you're buying is not a dumb thing. We'll see about how this organizes in the, in the uh, next chapter. But they're not a dumb thing. They actually have some cache, right? So most modern disks have 8 to 16 megs of cache, which means that if you go from the buffer cache and you push it to the disk, it's not really actually going to the disk. It's actually going to the disk cache. And disk uh, is running a little operating system inside, which decides when things should go actually to the disk, right? Which means that you, you really have no control over when things are actually written on the disk. So even if I say this should be written on disk, I can't be sure because there is another operating system inside the disk which is making decisions. So you'll end up in cases where even though you think you're writing something, even though you are pushing it from the buffer cache all the way to the disk, nothing goes to the disk and you run into problems, right? And the only way to do that, deal with that is to run the scanned disk and it can take forever and ever. And as you begin to big look at larger and larger file systems, if you have a several terabytes of file system, then it'll take you days to do the scanned disk, right? So one way to avoid this is the notion of a log structure file system. What it does is it essentially does something that we were looking at uh, before tra transactions and stuff. Right? What it does is every operation you do, it will log it. Right? So it, now it creates two copies. And so it creates a buffer. This is this essentially what it does. So suppose you have, let's say you're operating on four files. There are, there are a couple of programs in the system which are operating on four files, right? And you modify this little something here, this little something here, this little something here, this little something here, right? So since they are all in blocks and stuff, you want to keep them in cache. You don't want to write them until you need it to kind of thing. So this is still dirty, hasn't been pushed to disk, 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 right? And then you, you want to do the right thing and push, to, push them to the disk whenever you want them and everything, right? You get better, better performance by keeping them in memory, right? But, but you also want to write them to disk, right? But you haven't written enough stuff to push it to disk. You can't really change the system to say these things will have to be pushed to disk all the time. Then you lose performance, right? The way you solve them is to have a data structure called log. Right, I, I write it like this, but essentially it's, it's just a block, right? Every time you modify this, I, I log this entry, basically saying on file one, right, this offset to this offset to this offset, I wrote this new value, right? I log what I did into this stuff. I log what I did into this. I log what I did into this. I log what I did into this, right? And if I were to overwrite it, I log what I did into this, right? Even though those two updates cancel each other, right? So if I keep modifying a variable, the updates will can cancel each other. But I'm going to log it into this thing, right? Can you see what that does? Since I'm creating this logs at a much faster rate than what I'm doing here, this is going to get filled up much faster, right? But that, that, those blocks are going to get much faster, so I can keep writing them to disk, right? Because those 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 things are write ones, and you don't have to modify, you don't have to do anything to them. You're just writing them to the disk. So essentially, you are you are creating a log entries into a block. So these blocks you're you're writing much faster because these are being created at a much faster rate. So they capture all the modifications you're doing to the disk. You don't have to capture reads, but you're capturing all the writes to the disk, right? So now you have all these things written to disk, right? So now you have this log entry. So eventually when at some point if this was written to disk, right, and you know it's written to disk, you don't need this stuff, then you can go in the log and say, there are two log entries here, which were capturing what was happening here. Those have been returned to disk, so you don't have to worry about these entries, right? So you can go back into the log and clean out all the stuff that are no longer needed because they have already been reflected on the disk, right? And then you're kind of left with some entries which have been modified, which are still logged, which is not in the file system, right? So if the system was to crash at this point, 
all you have to do is log replay. So when you, when you boot up the system, the first thing it has to do is go through the logs and say this entry here, which is still valid, which means that this has not been reflected. So you just take this entry, update this particular block. Take this entry, update this particular block, right? And then you come to this entry and you say, okay, this there was a log entry here, already been reflected, so I don't have to replay this log entry, right? So I go through this log like this and make sure that uh, after I do this, the whatever operations you did now go into the file system, right? Does it make sense? That's the notion of log structure file system, right? Essentially, you create this log of everything that you're doing, right? You're creating two copies, and since it, these are logs, and since these are being returned in a sequential fashion, they tend to get flushed more often, right? You can also make them flushed more often because you know they're, they're logs. And as long as these logs are better written to disk, when you boot up the machine, all it has to do is first replay the logs. So if any of you run Linux or Mac or something, or, or Windows or something, if you look at the, the logs, you'll say replaying logs, right? It'll say replaying logs from 10,000 to million or something. And it'll go through them really fast because it can read them to them really fast and then make the, make the modifications and then you're good to go, right? So the next challenge is what to log here, right? In the example I was talking about, I was talking about files, modifying the files and everything, right? You can either have logs for directory entries or logs for files, right? How do you expect the logs to grow if you're operating on directories and how do you expect the logs to grow if you're operating on files? If you're operating on directory entries, right, where you're keeping track of files and all those things, how fast do you expect them to grow? As compared to if you're uh, capturing every modification to every file. Which one do you expect to grow like really fast? Uh, file modification Yeah, the file one would go really fast, especially if you're trying, if you're, if you're just writing whatever you want, right? If you're just modifying this little bit of base piece of stuff, it's one thing. But if you're doing what people normally do, which is read the whole file, write the whole file kind of thing, then your log would be as big as the files. So your log size would be growing so big that you probably need half of your file system for, for the log or, or more, right? It, because like I said, every modification has to be done, right? Even if it cancels each other, you'll have to make these, these stuff. So what typical file systems do is, even for log structure file systems, they only log metadata, not the actual data, right? Metadata in this concept is, is essentially the directories. So you only log the directories, not the file. So when you reboot the system, you replay the logs really fast because you're too lazy or you don't want to pay the cost of logging the whole files, right? So when, when people talk about log structure file systems, when you, when you, most of the machines you use are log structure, right? So if you, so you may, if you really want to see how it is, go back to like Windows 95 or something, pull the plug halfway through, run the scan disk from the beginning, right? You'll see that it'll take hours and hours. But now if you reboot the machine after, whatever, if you just pull the plug, reboot the machine, things seem to go much faster because you are doing these log structure stuff. And the only thing that is capturing right now is the directory entries, which means that your file modification may still be lost, but at least you'll be able to see this is a file, right? Which may or may not be what you thought you were doing, which is may, not, may or may not be what you're getting, but that's what you're getting, right? Because other way is too slow or too, too hard, so we don't try to do that. So essentially what you do in, in most of these log structure file systems is you log the directory entries just because it's easy to do, uh, you don't log the files because it's very hard to do, right? And unless you unless you are on a server or something, you don't really worry about these things, right? So that, that's that's one optimization which which makes your life a lot easier, and that's one of the reasons why you can have gigabytes of files on your laptop and stuff and stuff. So even if you lose the uh, the power, you you it seems to the scan just seems to be much faster, and you're you're able to make progress because it it replaces the stuff, right? But you have to remember that it still is not solving the problem of file corruption because that's a separate issue. So it may be the case that something that you modified was lost because it, it was never written to the file. So you may have to once in a while run the whole real scan disk, run the real FSK to clean those up. And if any of you run those, it takes a long time, right? If, like Linux and all would do that every so often, it'll run the whole thing. It's a very slow process and you have to do that because of the, the notion, right? Um, The other way that the 
server, server file systems deal with this problem is through a notion of a non-volatile RAM, right? So most of the big servers that you buy, if you if you buy like a server that like Notre Dame has, they have a big chunk of memory called non-volatile RAM. It's battery backed. So essentially all this cache goes, to, so all the logs go into the NVRAM. So even if the if you lose the power, you store everything on the NVRAM, so you get some more, uh, you get some benefit. And those things tend to be expensive, right? So you don't want to do this stuff all the time, but not anymore. The future is towards better flash memory. Right? Flash memory is getting cheaper and cheaper. In the future, your laptops will have some, I think it's already happening, right? They call it hybrid disk or whatever. But essentially you'll have some chunk of memory within your laptop, which is, um, which is stable, right? So you want to write these logs as, as fast as possible. So the, the, lo the larger memory you have, like if you, let's, let's say if I have like, give you like, you know, 50 gigs of flash memory, right? So then I can think about writing all the logs into that flash memory as fast as possible. So I'll be able to do not just the directory, but also the flash, but for that technology has to catch up and you're still waiting for those. And in that case, you will not have file system corruption and stuff. Um, and we'll ca continue with the mass, uh, the mass storage, how, how the hardware really works on all this in the next lecture. And one of the things to remember on all this stuff is, if you really understood how file systems work, you should be scared. Because you're probabilistically getting what you stored stay in the system, right? When you write something, we, we never make a guarantee 100%. We don't even make 99%, right? The, person, the, the guarantee we are making is very, very poor, right? And we kind of live, live with that, oblivious to what is really happening. And the problem is not solved when you do a backup, because backup is still backing up that corrupted stuff, right? It's, it's, it's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do, but if you want to know something more about it, I can give you pointers on how bad things are with the file system. Because you want to get performance, and sometimes things fall out, fall through the crack, right? I'll, I'll see you guys a little bit later on Friday.